Hey, I'm Kelly Albrecht, and um, I'm going to talk about DevOps and uh, having uh, the idea of DevOps on ramping onto it by thinking about customer satisfaction. Um, we do uh, Agile workshops. We did an Agile workshop yesterday, and one of the questions we do an assessment with the with the group to assess their agility. And one of the questions is it's safe and possible to release work at any time. And so the people are answering for their teams and they're answering, is this inconsistent, rarely, sometimes, consistent? is this a consistent thing? Is it consistently safe and possible to re release work at any time? And the result from the group was 47%. So less than half felt it was safe and possible to release work at any time. Uh, this question is taken a certain way, usually by most people, and that is that they could uh, at any minute walk up to a server or something and click a release button of some work if they wanted to. And this is a uh, confusing and a strange uh, thing to think about. Um, they bring up, uh, when we talk about this question, the issues of trust come up, like it is not uh, safe and possible to release work at any time because I'm not trusted to do it, or I don't trust others to do it. Uh, there's safety concerns. Is it safe? Uh, it's not safe. Uh, things could go wrong. Things could break. Uh, process issues come up. Uh, we have to check the work or review the work. And with each one of these in a conversation, you can talk about like, well, maybe we can work on having more trust, or maybe we can work on mitigating risks and making things safer. Maybe we can tweak process. And it eventually comes down to, as it did in yesterday's workshop, down to a bigger process. And the people in the group describe what goes on in uh, on their teams at, at a major process level where they, the development team does some work and then all that work goes to functional tests to test if it's functioning in the way it's supposed to function. And there are other, there are other phases, but roughly this, is, this was what was most common to everybody in there. And after functional tests, it moves to uh, performance testing. Um, and then eventually that whole batch of stuff gets pushed over onto the ops people. And uh, ops people do, do their work they schedule it and they, they make it work uh, on production. Sometimes they have to rewrite some stuff. Sometimes they have to kick the whole batch back to those developers who do silly things sometimes. And eventually it ships onto production. And really, if you think about it, uh, this batch of stuff started at a, as a batch of ideas that got scheduled for development. And that batch of stuff moved across the chain and eventually that whole batch of stuff was delivered as value to customers, maybe months later. So this is really a batching issue. We've got batches of things. And the, uh, fortunately, uh, we have an exercise that we do in the workshop that's all about this. Uh, group, people in groups tend to optimize batches, tend to, tend to want to optimize for themselves or for their group. And they think, if I just get a batch of stuff and I get left alone, I can become the best person or group or team at processing a batch of things. And then when I do that as quickly as possible, I can move that whole batch of things to the next group. And that's going to be the fastest, simplest, most efficient way to do it. In our exercise, though, the exercise is called the penny game. And what we do is we get four people and they process their batches of pennies. And processing a batch of pennies is to flip each one over and move that batch to the next person. And they all share the responsibility of timing the penny flipping and recording it. And they record it in a spreadsheet where there's e the name of each penny flipper and the time that it takes each penny flipper to flip their batches of pennies. They document all the times and they record the results. And we start with a batch of 20 pennies. And so the first person flips the all 20 pennies and moves it to the next person who flips all 20 pennies and moves it to the next person until finally the fourth person flips all 20 pennies and moves them to the customer. When you do a batch of 20, the customer gets their first penny of value when all 20 pennies are flipped by the fourth person. About And, and this typically is the same numbers every single time. The customer gets their first 
penny and their last penny at the same time at around two minutes. I'm not going to describe what happens with five, but we do that too, and it, usually at five people are like, I get it. Um, but if you look at batch, when you do a batch of one, where the first person flips a penny, sends it to the next person, the next person flips that penny, sends it to the next person, and so on, the customer gets their first penny in five seconds. So compare that to the two minutes that it took for the customer to get any pennies at all. But even more interestingly, the customer gets the last of the 20 pennies, which is the entire batch that originally took two minutes to get to them. They now get that in around, I've seen it as low as 30 seconds. So potentially when you do a much smaller batch size, you can start getting value. Uh, I, I'm not even gonna calculate how much more that is, two minutes to five seconds. Maybe somebody in the audience can do that. Uh, but the whole batch of the, of the original idea becoming value almost four times faster. So there's, there are tangible exercises we can do to see that if we break down our work into smaller batches, we can deliver customer, uh, value to customers more frequently and much faster. So there's a lot of uh, work in DevOps, and I think we kind of lose track of what the point of DevOps was originally, and it wasn't so much automate everything. That kind of became a thing that we did to try to, to do the point of DevOps. But the point of DevOps is to flip things. So rather than going through all of these big batch phases, we break down our work smaller and we get all the people together on the same team. You can see on the left is Dev, then there's all these other phases, and on the right is Ops. And one of the terms that's used for each phase becomes a wall of confusion between the other phase. And you want to get everybody on the same team and you want to shrink this down so that dev and ops are right next to each other and everybody in between is on the same team. And so you get something more like this where you're releasing batches of less at any time. So you can think about, and that's another thing to think about with this, when we ask the group the question, can you, re are you is it safe to uh, release work at any time? They think, well, could I do it at any minute? But any time is an interesting thing to think about when releases usually take months. Maybe releasing something this week would be like any time. And you could do that if you were trying to do less together with everybody needed to do it to get it to the customer. So. It is safe and possible to release work at any time, but we need to uh, bring some of this rationale and, and, and it, is, it is taking hold in some places, but from the workshop yesterday, uh, it's about 47%. We aspire to be self-organizing, well-formed teams, and we should continue to do so. Our customers will appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? So for those just joining us, there's, a, there's, there's some confusion. Um, they put me in the lightning talks that are happening later at 10, but I never got notified that that was a thing. And they also put me as a full session right now, and I saw that on the schedule. So I have a full session because I've given this before, but then they also emailed me this morning saying that this talk was going to be five minutes, and if I went a minute over five minutes, they were going to cut me off. So I made this like 30 minutes ago, and I came in and worked it out with the people in here that we figured it out. So what I figured was I'd do this, get it on recording, and then with the remainder of the time, jump into probably... I think this is the longer one.
Okay. So I'm not going to touch on the, the penny game or any of that stuff. So if anybody any questions about that? No? Okay. Has anybody done that? Done the penny game? No. All right. So we just kind of talked about that. Um, DevOps, uh, if, if you were to go to any conference, and any Drupal conference, for example, and try to figure out what DevOps is, you would think that DevOps is about continuous integration and automated testing. Uh, and there, I gave this talk at DrupalCon, and I was a DevOps talk. Uh, I was one of 11, and there were 10 DevOps talks that were about continuous integration and testing. And then there was my, my DevOps talk. So we touched on this uh, in lightning fashion uh, just a moment ago, but um, there used to be, or there still is in a lot of organizations, this idea that dev does its work and then it throws it over the wall to, the, to operations, who owns production, who uh, controls what, how production works. And, and this is changing, but it's still this case in some places where the development team, the work that they do, is not in an environment that mirrors production. That's something that's new in the last several years. Uh, typically, operations uh, would control what production was like, and they would get the work from development, and they would typically have to rework it to make it work in production. And as you can imagine, this caused all sorts of issues where, where things would fail, deployments became very risky, and a lot of times finger pointing would happen and this is where things like, well, it worked on my machine would come from because the developers would get it working on their machine and but they would throw it over the wall to ops and ops would put it into production which was different than the development machine and then it wouldn't work. And that's just one example of the wall of confusion and the finger pointing and the very non-collaborative element of the dev team and the ops team and people started to say this needs to change. Um, so they started trying to get closer together and work closer together and it's gone a little bit, um, I think on a tangent from the original uh, goal of the whole thing and an example of this tangent is there's this, like you can go on Twitter and see this hashtag no ops is the idea that hey we, we never liked these ops people there's DevOps, that's great, but let's just automate the ops people right out of the picture. And that's not exactly uh, solving the original thing, which is getting closer to the customer and producing a better product. Um, so here's the longer, the longer chain, if you think about it, something goes into, um, this is kind of a wider take on, on DevOps. Where, you, where if we take the idea that we're trying to get closer to our customer, we also want to have a better product and understand how to get closer to, the, to our customer after it becomes, uh, it go, after the product goes live. So we still need, we still need all the people because if we, want to op, if we want to get rid of the ops people and follow that strategy further, we'll have to automate the product team and we're not really going to automate the community. We're really going to have to face this issue of having empathy and understanding of our customers and figuring out and, and, and working on our feedback loop and extending those same ideas of DevOps across the rest of the chain to automate uh, as much, automate and streamline as much as possible uh, the, the feedback loop that we can uh, find out from our customers that we're delivering the right product and what a better product would look like. So we need everybody. We need all these people. Um, if we mash this together in uh, DevOps fashion, this is where we start to get this idea of a, of a loop of work. And we're pretty good at the half of the circle that's not colored in at understanding that, at, at, at building our work. We've got amazing tools to um, version control our work, 
commit our work into a continuous integration which pulls that work and, and runs all of our tests and deploys it. And deployments have gotten a lot easier and a lot safer. And that is the understanding of DevOps today. But there is the rest of the feedback loop, which is that after it goes into, into deployment and it goes into operation and people use it, the people that we're developing our work for to use, we want, to, we want them to know what we're building for them and we want them to know how to use it. And we want to know from them if it was what they asked for and how could it be better? And we want to take those ideas back into planning and figure out what the priority of those new ideas are and build the, build the ideas with the most value first and run that through the parts of, of the DevOps loop that we're familiar with and deploy it out again and continue the relationship. And the, it's a relationship be between us and our customers and a good relationship prioritizes each other in it. So, I'm not gonna say anything about that, but uh, so one way to think about this up in the top right corner by deploy, when you deploy something from the customer's perspective, that's what's new. We're deploying something what's new. We should let them know that. We should reach out, we should tell them, and you've probably experienced this anytime you update an app in the app store. Um, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but it'll, it'll tell you. And sometimes people write funny notes about it. Once it's in operation, we want them to know what is in operation, and we want them to be good users of it so they can experience the work as we've intended. And we can provide contextual help information is one way to do that. Um, we also wanna know uh, how is it? How is it the stuff that we've made for you? And so we can build in nice little, uh, quick little questions. Was this what you were looking for? Um, was this page useful? Um, ask for help here. You know, anytime where the help uh, our, our self-help information falls short, we want them to be able to contact us for support. We want them to know that we're there for them. Um, but we take that feedback and we process it into planning and we think about what are we gonna do next. And we can even involve the customer in that what's next aspect of our, of our work and, and find ways to get them to vote on what features they want and to submit new features. And when it goes back around the chain and we tell them what's new, that's when they can see that, hey, we did do that stuff, we did listen, and we did build those ideas that you suggested to us. So it's not a waste of your time to participate in this relationship. It's not a waste of your time to learn how to use the product better, and, and definitely not a waste of your time to get feedback to it, because we, we're here for you, we're doing this for you, and we recognize that. If that product is Drupal, as it often is for most people here, we can think about ways to, um, to involve Drupal in this. And that's because if we're building something in Drupal for our customers, Drupal tends to be the product that they're using. So websites are a lot more complex than just showing five to 10 to 15 to even 30 to even hundreds of pages. It's more complex than just showing pages. Typically there's functionality. Uh, a lot of that functionality is in the content management system itself. Drupal, we use Drupal because it's highly configurable in very elegant ways and we can configure it to provide all sorts of functionality, to provide the ability to customers to create all sorts of content types. Content types that Drupal never imagined being created when it, as we built it, as we've made Drupal for the community to use, we made Drupal to be something that could be configured to create, for, our, for the customers to be able to create more of what they want. So here's some ideas about using Drupal to communicate what's new and fixed with each delivery. Here's what the customer gets from Drupal right now. If, if you're a customer and you're using Drupal as a product and you install it and you log in, you get this. I don't know if this communicates how much we care about our users of Drupal when our users log in, but 
we're not, it's, it certainly communicates that we're not trying to do too much. Um, one of our competitors in the CMS scene is WordPress, and, and, and you may have experienced that WordPress does a much better job of, uh, of communicating with their customers that they care. So one idea here, and this is just fashion in the current Drupal theme, we could have release notes on this user page, what's new with Drupal. Um, these could be pulled directly from the community. Uh, it also wouldn't be too hard at all from a development point of view to have the, our features and custom modules that we develop have a mechanism for us to write in our own little release notes or our own little change log that could show up on this page. We could also have on this page something very nice and useful like, hey, here's some frequently used content. And the, this row down at the bottom is styled in a, in a manner that we'll see in, in the next few slides. Uh, and I'll explain that there. On this page, on the, where it says new content type added, this could be pulling from some, from some new feature that we've added to the, uh, to the product and we want our customers to know about it when they log in. And we've configured a little link to take a tour. So there's a new product added, take a tour here. Our customers could take that tour and they could check out this new product content type, this new content type we've added to our product. In this example, we've added the new, a new basic page. And the tour module comes in Drupal. Has anybody, has anybody heard, heard of tour? one person, a very small percentage of the audience for those at home. Um, that it, that's, that's my most common response. I've been talking about this for a while. Nobody knows that Tor exists and it comes enabled in Drupal 8 core by default, so it exists. The issue is that there's no good user experience for configuring Tors. Um, it, needs, it still needs a lot of work. It, it's, it's about at best, in most places, 90% done, and, and in some other places, it needs it needs some new features. And we've uh, we've developed those features, and we've implemented those features uh, with others. Uh, so it, it will get there if um, you know whenever we can build a product to use it, we'll, we can do it. Um, but this is an example of a modal window, uh, a, a pop-up configured to be a modal window. Here's what's new with this page. Another thing about Tor is if there's a tour configured for a page, you can trigger it to automatically pop up by sending, that per, by sending your user to that page with question mark tour at the end of the URL and the, that will trigger it to auto start. So here we've, auto, we've sent them to this new content type and we've auto started the what's new pop up to tell them what's new with this. But we can continue the tour, the rest of the tour, and we can show them things like, hey, here's an interesting field that is um, complicated and could, you could use some more help with it and we can direct them to, to read the page help which could be additional content on the site and maybe they know, uh, they, they can click through to read that help or they can close the tip. If they do click on the, the link that we provided in that tip to read more that we've written in depth about that field, we're essentially providing contextual guides and resources on these new site features. So we're really, we're really taking care to, take, uh, to care for our customer. And we're building that all into our workflow, which is the DevOps mindset. So let's say that they clicked page help. It could just be, it could be built right into our, into our site. But if we want to take this further and think about how do we automate and streamline this, I've got some ideas. And really this is not, I'm not saying this is how this needs to be done. I'm saying let's try to find, let's try to either do this or do a better version of this. But right now built into the Drupal, the Drupal way of doing things is whenever you add a field to a content type, you can also add some help text. And it's just this box of pretty limited information. But we want to build in more, uh, potentially a longer form content to help educate our customer on being better content authors. And we can do, we can start with that right at the field level 
by enabling ourselves to write longer form content uh, attached to each field. So we could add in a little WYSIWYG. Maybe, we, maybe this, it's kind of interesting to use this short description field as an, as an example because it seems so obvious probably what it's for, but let's imagine that there's much more hiding behind our intention for this product and that's why we need to tell our, our customers more about it. That would show up on this page. Let's integrate it right into our page. How would we, how would we do that? So let's say that we have on the left a uh, page of help about the whole entire content type and we want to automate and streamline providing longer form help per field and we don't want to have to update it in three different places, we just want to pull it in automatically. This would be one start of an idea to do that, but how, so how would we do this? Let's say that we edited this help information and this is what it looked like behind it. This could be uh, this could be just basic content as we're familiar with it, uh, help content that we're writing for each e each page or each feature of the site. But this particular page is for a particular piece of con a particular content type. We can relate it to that content type, and since Drupal knows what fields are in its content types, it can pull in information. So first of all. The title of this help page is going to come from the title uh, field of the help page that we're editing. Same with any of the subtitle. But all of this other stuff can pull in from the, the relationship to the content type. And so the content type is going to have some description information. It's going to have fields with potentially its uh, longer form help information. Um, so we can really, at the field level, at the micro feature level of each content type in this example, we can be adding this longer form help information and keeping it updated as part of our development process and, every, and with every deployment. And then it will in turn feed into all of our help pages. Just an idea. Once we've structured our help content in this way, we can feed it into all sorts of pages, all sorts of places. So let's say we've got this basic help page with wired up to content types where appropriate. We can also feed it into something like over on the left, which over on the left is, um, if you look down at the bottom, at the bottom call to action on the left is create this basic page. So this would be an alternative way to show around the site, hey, you, you can add this piece of content. Here's a little blurb about it. If we know, if the site knows there's a tour configured for that content type, they can have the button that goes to that content type, question mark tour to automatically start the tour. Um, all of this information can be pulled from this help page if we were to continue with this idea. And underlying this idea is the strategy of streamlining and automating the providing of our help content and building it into our development process. Um, and it can pull it in from this help page, so it could have an image, but then all this other stuff, it knows what content type the help page is for, and it can pull in this information. And so at this point, we're just working with, uh, at this point in this idea, we're just working with Drupal content, and that means that once we're working with Drupal content, we can do anything that, uh, with it that we can do with, with nodes, for example, nodes and entities. So, to, te to step e even further, here's another page that doesn't really communicate to our users that we're all too interested in their experience. But now that we've just looked at that help page, which gives us the ability to have much more interesting content and imagery and a layout that's all dynamically pulling from, from uh, longer form field help content, we can build something in views that is a view of that content that looks something more like this. So imagine you go to add content to your website. You don't do it all the time and you get here with some very helpful information sharing, uh, explaining to you what are all the pieces, the, all, all the pieces of functionality, all the features of your website. Your website to you as a user of a product is a product in the, um, 
in a way that you're, you're using it to create landing pages, you're using it to create blog pages, you could be using it to create uh, um, all sorts of services for your uh, users to use, for your customers to use. That's often the case that the customers or the users of the product we're building have customers and users themselves. And they're needing to use what we built as a product to build their product for their customers. So we want that to be a good experience because the better experience that is for them, the better product they'll be able to provide for their customers. Since we're just working with content, we can build uh, an entire help portal for our customers. Here's what help looks like right now on Drupal. A comment on, on the help system in Drupal seems to be more about helping developers add help content and then look at it. I don't know many developers that, that need to use this help content, but there is an effort to make this better. I think it's still aimed at making it better in the same ways that it's trying to be good right now, but I think we can do even better for in that in, in the sense of thinking about making our product better for our customers. So just rearranging it, we can build a grid. Since our help pages on, on the idea we've been walking through, since those help pages is content, we can categorize it. So down at the bottom we're browsing it by topic. So we just talked about help pages for content types. We could write help pages for content strategy and tips and tricks. But we could build a, a panel layout, a nice help center. Since it's content, it's all searchable. So, so search becomes trivially easy at the top. Help information on a Drupal website right now out of the box is not searchable. Then of course we want, so that, so of course we want to get feedback. All, those, all that previous stuff is really about letting our customer know what's new, what we've developed and deployed for them, and educating them on how to use it the best. And that's going to help us get better feedback because when they're better users of our product, they're going to have less questions about how to use it and less confusion about how to use it, changing the percentage of the feedback that we have to wade through as we get it. It will make that the percentage of feedback that is for making our product better or fixing problems with our product. It will increase the percentage of uh, information, of that type of information over um, easy to answer support questions. And we can just build these things in. You've seen this. This is common in a lot, a lot of products already. And it's, it's a constant um, problem to solve. How do, you, how do you encourage people to give you feed? It's very hard to get feedback from people. How do you encourage them to give you feedback without annoying them or bothering them, but make it easy, easy enough to do that? And that's something that we can continue to work on. So let's collect these feature requests in bug reports and bring it to planning. And then, oh, let me see what's going on here. Oh, these are screenshots from, we did a lot of this work uh, recently with uh, mass.gov. They're, what they're doing right now probably, I don't think it even looks like this anymore. It looks a lot better. Like the tour and the, well, it kind of looks like that. It looks bad. Yeah, this is from this is from a while ago. But anyway, we have we have been doing some of this work um, with some excellent partners who really appreciate their customers and are thinking in the in a very same way about um, their DevOps mindset and building good products for their customers. Um, but really, we want to. Oh, and before I move on. Uh, all of those slides, uh, the, those next, those slides that I'm going to skip, you should check out the recordings. Um, there's a much better presentation about specifically that aspect of things that's much more current. And it was, what was it called? We've got somebody in the audience that gave that. Uh, the one that you did yesterday. Scaling our voice, supporting 600 Mastego followers. Yeah. So take a look at that video. I thought it was excellent. Um, very good presentation. And it'll be, I think it would be interesting to watch that and think about some of this thinking and, and to hear about the things that they did with, with uh, similar goals in mind. Um, 
but really we want to we want to get closer to our customers and we want to build them a better product and we want to release more frequently uh, to them and more clearly and not only do we want to automate the the testing and the and the and making releasing easier but we also want to streamline our communication and our and our collection of feedback and bringing that into future planning um, and to keep that loop going and to keep that continuous improvement continuously improving developing a software product is complex yet flexible it's soft it's a so, it's a soft uh, flexible product it's software this means that the closer the operators of our product are to the developers of our product, the shorter our feedback loops can be and the better our product will become. When change is easy, as it can be in software development, our awareness of any potential uh, thing that could change fuels our improvement. We need to be aware. We need our customers to be aware of what we're delivering and how to use it, and we need to be aware of how they're experiencing it so that we can improve their experience. We need everyone's perspective to make our product as intuitive as possible. Our product needs to be inclusive and accessible by as many customers and we need to be able to get feedback from as many customers as possible. So start your courageous journey of openness and collaboration to share in a focus on your commitments to continuously improve your product. If you do this, your customers will get closer to you. Thank you. Cool. Plenty of time for questions and plenty of time for me to get to my second version of this talk. You said that the Tor product yep. it had a not so great user experience. Oh, for building it. Oh, I'm glad you asked about that. I think that was something that I intended to say but not have it written on the screen. So uh, Tor is, I think, from my experience in giving this talk, is the most interesting aspect of it to people. They're like, wait, what? Drupal can do this? And um, right now, if you want to build a Tor, you have to write YAML files. So, so it's from the designer right. developer side, not from the person, like the customer side. There is a module called Tor UI. Um, but it, it has some bugs and it doesn't quite get you all the way there. And I think, I think one of the reasons why Tor isn't really finished being developed is that the users, us who build, the, build sites with Drupal, we're not clamoring for it. We're not saying we want something to help us build, build this type of functionality to help our customers. So, so the developers have dumped a ton of effort in to get it where it is, but it's just kind of where it ended up. Um, but interestingly enough, the way it does work is really nice if we're thinking about how do we build this into our development workflow. So it, it is in code. So you could think about, let's say you have a product owner who's watching the feature requests and looking at a top prioritized one and they decide, let's work on this thing. At that point, that product owner knows the vision for the product and how it will work at the end. And they can actually, before the thing's been developed at all, they can start writing the tour for it. They can start thinking like, I want this to work a certain way and I want it to be the case that when it's working that a customer will be able to read this tour tip and it will match the functionality. So in a sense, it's like writing the tests before, before the code. So you can build that into your issues that you write where it's like, all right, add this field, but also add a tip on this page. And so the developer who adds that field they know what page it's going to be for. They know where that tip's going to be on the page. They can quickly write the YAML within that code commit for the tour tip. And, and the whole thing deploys at the same time and the tip just deploys with the, with the functionality. And so then even, even updating it later, you know, maybe they update that field later, all right, that's gonna change the tip text. That's just all in the same issue or in the same story and subtask collection of stuff and that all gets changed in code and all deploys at the same time. And so if our, if our help text or our longer form help content is at that field level too, that's all deploying at the same time. So we're really, can, we're really building in. And it's happening in a lot of ways with accessibility right now. Like if we really want accessible websites, we've got to 
build that into our development process. It can't be something that we rush all these features out the door and they're all basically inaccessible for the, for the month it takes for our accessibility person to catch it. Like that doesn't work. So it's all, it's all part of getting us all together and developing the product together so it all goes up at the same time. Cool. Yeah. Can you uh, describe a bit the mechanics of that? What is this helpful link at the bottom? And you say yes or no? Oh, sure. Yes. Well, so basically, I mean, that could be any number of things. That could be embedded from a third party service that you're collecting feedback. It could also be like a like a flag, uh, like a I think I'm not sure if it's still called the flag module in Drupal 8, but where you're just asking the user to click yes or no, and it's a feature. So some people would use it to bookmark something. I think the Drupal conference sites still use it to say you're going to schedule the session or go to the session or not. Is that oh? But you want, so is there a module that just serves that purpose that people use, or is that uh, you could either. I'm sure there's uh, there's there's definitely the flag module, uh, and there, there there might be others, but there's also um, at, at mass.gov they're using Formstack and just embedding it in the bottom of the page. So it's really mostly the idea of it, but you can do it in Drupal. And if you do actually, if you do do it in Drupal and you do use the flag module, you can have other things like save this page. Like so, and, you, and so then the cus then the customer could have saved help pages, but yeah, if you yeah if you use the flag module, you could get some statistics about how many users have flagged this help page as useful, how many users have flagged this help page as not useful, and then you could improve them based on on that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thanks everybody. If you want to rewatch that lightning talk, it's happening at 10 a.m. upstairs. <laughs> Thanks.